Well, good morning or here in South Dakota. It's evening. The sun is setting over here and I wish I could get it and get it on film. We'll show some pictures at some point, some of the most amazing sunsets that I have ever seen. And I'm taking the opportunity to share part 12 of 2 Corinthians with you from this amazing location. What a privilege it is for a group of men to come up here on motorcycles and we've been able to do some work on the missionaries house here. Uh, they have a farmhouse that they're moving into. They just had some missionaries that are going to be working with them, move here from Mississippi, sold everything to come up here and work with them. And so we're trying to get their house ready so that the, they can move in. And so we've been tearing things out, hanging barn doors, we're, we're doing it all and it's been an amazing time. And because of COVID, we haven't been able to go into Allen, the village right here on the reservation and minister like we normally do. Uh, so we've been spending time focused on, on the missionaries and the, and the church that's up here to my right. You may not be able to see it. We tore out some stuff in the sanctuary, gonna redo that, tore out carpeting, painted some walls, just really trying to be the hands and feet of Jesus. So continue. Uh, by the time you get this, I'll be back home, but continue to pray for Pass Creek Church as well. Well, we're in 2 Corinthians. We're going to jump ahead to chapter 10. You're going to notice that we passed over chapters 8 and 9. Well, I've asked Alan Kunkel to share on chapters 8 and 9 later this month, September 27th. He will be sharing from those passages when he gets back from his trip. We, um, we're, so we're going to jump ahead a little bit. They're not unimportant chapters, but we're going to get to them later. I don't know if you have ever been in a place or experienced this where somebody has undercut your authority. Maybe it's you're trying to teach your kids something um, and somebody comes in and tells them exactly the opposite of what you've been telling them to do. Maybe it's at work. Maybe you manage some people and somebody else comes in and, and sows dissension or whatever, and they undercut your authority. Well, that's what happened to Paul. Paul established the church in Corinth. We've talked about that many times. We're 12 weeks into this. He established this church in Corinth, and then people came in after him. He established the church, was there 18 months, and then went off to establish other churches. People came in after him that were charismatic leaders. They were people that, that attracted people to themselves, but undermined the authority that Paul had in that church, and they basically told people that Paul was weak. They spoke against him. They caused dissension within the church. And we know that sin broke out in that church. We know that there was sexual immorality. We know that there was false teaching. These things were happening. And Paul sent these really difficult letters to the people because of that. Well, Paul comes back in chapter 10 and he talks about his authority and why he sent such difficult letters and what that meant and so we're going to talk about spiritual authority today. See, unfortunately, one of the ways that Satan attacks churches and attacks ministers is by sowing dissension within the church. I remember being a youth pastor. Every church I youth pastored at, there were people in the church that would come to me and say, man, you would make a great pastor. Matter of fact, you'd be a better pastor than the one we have right now. Tell you what. That sounds good on the one side. You feel like, oh, wow, people love what you do. But what that does is that undermines the authority of the pastor. And so I had to not run with that. I had to learn really early on in ministry that there's always going to be people that come in and try to stroke your ego because they're dissatisfied with things that are happening in the church and it sows dissension. See, there is spiritual authority that's in the church. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit. I want you to jump over to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And if you've got the notes, the first point is simply going to be spiritual authority. It's what I named the message. It's what we're going to talk about a little bit. I'm going to read just verses 7 and 8 right now. We're going to come back and hit some other verses out of chapter 10 in just a moment. But let's look at chapter um, 10, verses 7 and 8. So said, look at the obvious facts. Those who say they belong to Christ must recognize that we belong to Christ as much as they do. I may seem to be boasting too much about the authority given to us by the Lord, but our authority builds you up. It doesn't tear you down, so I will not be ashamed of using my authority. 
Who gave Paul the authority? Now, if you look back there in verse 8, it says, given to us by the Lord. The Lord gave Paul that authority. He was the head of that church. He established that church. He was given authority by God. Now, I want to show you where God gave him that authority. If you jump over to Acts chapter 9, if you know anything about Paul's story, Paul used to be named Saul, and Saul was persecuting the church. He was out to arrest Christians, was there to give a, his nod to executing Christians. He was trying to stamp out Christianity. He was a Pharisee. He was all about the rules and the law. And he saw Christianity, he saw the followers of Jesus as being uh, something that was against, he thought it was blasphemy. He didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah until Jesus confronted him on the road to Damascus. In this, I just want to read Acts chapter 9, verse 15. And this is what God was saying to Ananias, who he sent Saul to. He, he confronted Saul on the road to Damascus. He blinded him with a supernatural light, said, why are you persecuting me? And Paul said, who are you? He said, I'm Jesus, the one you're persecuting. Then he told him to go to Damascus and find a man named Ananias. And so Paul was blinded by this. He had his, the guys that were with him, led him to Damascus, and he went to Ananias. And this is what Ananias, or this is what the Lord said to Ananias about Saul, because he was afraid of Saul. He thought, man, Saul's trying to kill us. So this is what he said. He said, but the Lord said, go f for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings, as well as to the people of Israel. God gave Paul the spiritual authority to carry his gospel around the world, especially to the Gentiles. Corinth was Gentiles. We're Gentiles. If you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. We're Gentiles. Most of us. Maybe you are a Jew. Maybe you grew up in a Jewish household. But Paul was given that authority. God called Paul. He filled him with the Holy Spirit and gave him authority. That's a pretty awesome thing. See, God has given that same authority to pastors and to leaders, really to Christians. But he's given it to pastors because he calls us to shepherd. A pastor means to shepherd a church. When you call Kennesaw Family Life Church your church home, Jennifer and I are your pastors. We're your shepherds. We're responsible for your spiritual growth. We're responsible for training you and equipping you to do the gospel. We're not to hold your hand and force you to be a Christian, but we are responsible for the church. God's given a spiritual authority in the church. It's not something I take lightly. It's a really big responsibility. Acts chapter 20, verse 28, he said this to the disciples as he told them to go out and plant churches. This is what he said. So guard yourselves. Again, Acts chapter 20, verse 28. So guard yourselves and God's people. Feed the and shepherd God's flocks. You get that? Feed and shepherd God's flocks. Feeding you right now with the word of God. His church purchased with his own blood. This is Jesus's church purchased with his own blood over which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as leaders. The Holy Spirit gave Jennifer and I a passion for the city of Kennesaw and the plan of church. And God has gifted us with you as a part of our church. And he's called us to shepherd you. He's called us to care for you and love for you and to provide for you spiritual nourishment, to equip you to go and do ministry as God has called you to do. And God's given some of you spiritual authority over ministries and over small groups and over other things. We're going to talk about how that authority works. But God has given us the authority to guard his flock that Jesus purchased with his own blood. We've been purchased with the blood of Jesus. It's not something to be taken lightly. Now look at this. As a matter of fact, James 3.1 gives this warning. Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church. For we who teach will be judged more strictly. When I stand before God, I am responsible 
for how I led each one of you. I'm responsible for every ministry that I've ever been a part of, that I've been over in any way for how I led them. And I'll be honest, I'll be ashamed at some of the ways I've led at times. It's only by the grace of God and through the power of the Holy Spirit I'm able to lead it all. And I am responsible for that. That's why I pray. That's why I'm not afraid to preach messages that says, hey, we've got to be billboards for Christ. We've got to check the way we live because when we go out into the community, people need to not see that we're Christians because we have bumper stickers and t-shirts. They need to see that we're Christians by the way we live, by the way we love, by the way we care for our community. That's who we are. Paul knew that he had this call in his life and he had to shepherd the people of the church that he started. I don't know who he put in place to lead that church, but word kept coming back to Paul that things were being undercut and undermined and that that caused division in, in the church. It caused false teachers to come in and share bad gospel. It caused people to fall into sin. There was not a check there. But then Paul sent the letters and correction happened. If you remember just a couple chapters ago, Paul was commending them for correcting the issues, for coming under that spiritual authority, because Paul didn't want to come and put the hammer down. He didn't want to come and say, hey, look, I've got this spiritual authority. You're not going to like it if I come. We have that authority. As leaders, we have to speak the truth in love. We don't want to tear anybody down, but at the same time, we have to guard for our flock. And if somebody comes in tearing apart our flock, we need to deal with it. And it's the worst thing that we do as pastors. I never like to set people down and say, hey, what's going on here? Matter of fact, I know going into those conversations that the person sitting across from me could leave the church, and we've had that happen. Because difficult situations needed to be dealt with head on so that we could protect the flock. If you were a shepherd, and that's why he uses the shepherd and the sheep, if you were a shepherd and a wild animal came in to mess with your sheep, you're going to do something about it. That's our job as pastors. We have an obligation to protect you So what does this mean for members of the church? Now listen to this. This is going to flip this around. If you're a member of the church, what does this mean for you? Hebrews gives us this. Many people think Paul wrote Hebrews. We don't really know who. He didn't ever write his name to it. But Hebrews 13, 17 says this. Obey your spiritual leaders and do what they say. Their work is to watch over your souls and they are accountable to God. Give them reason to do this with joy and not with sorrow that would certainly not be for your benefit. Look, it's awkward for me to read that scripture because look, it says, obey your spiritual leaders. God, the Bible's telling you to obey me. I feel weird saying that. I never want to lord over any of you. But look, I have authority over me. I am a pastor in the assemblies of God. I have people that are over me. I have a presbyter that's over me. I have a general superintendent that's over me. I have those in spiritual authority over me that I need to follow their instructions. I need to follow their lead. They shepherd me. We're all under spiritual authority. We're all under that umbrella and we need to obey our spiritual leaders. Their job is to watch over us and account for our souls. That's my job. I pray over you. That's why we have prayer at 4.30, Monday through Thursday, so we can pray together. I pray over you every day. Some of you know I'll send out text, say, hey, I'm praying for you. That's our job. So it's a little bit awkward for me to say that, but we're all under spiritual authority. Now I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about how we, as leaders, are responsible for someone else how we deal with somebody who's not respecting that spiritual authority, what we need to do. This doesn't only apply to pastors. It really applies to all of us as Christians because as Christians, we should be discipling others and we should have people following us and we should be there to lead them, love them, and correct them. 
And there is really a hierarchy that happens in that as pastors, as we train you and you lead small groups and you lead other things, you have the opportunity to be spiritual parents or spiritual leaders to those that are following you. So the second thing today is authority and use. What does that look like? And I'm going to jump to verses 1 through 6 of, of chapter 10. So give me just a minute. It says in chapter, in verse 1 of chapter 10, it says, Now I, Paul, appeal to you with the gentleness and kindness of Christ, though I realize you think I am timid in person and bold only when I write from far away. Well, I'm begging you now so that when I come, I won't have to be bold with those who think we act from human motives. We are human. But we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God, and we capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. And after you have become fully obedient, we punish everyone who remains disobedient. No leader wants to discipline anybody. At least not any Christian leader that I know of. And if they, if they really want to discipline somebody, they're probably, probably not following Christ the way they should. It's uncomfortable. It's difficult. So how do we deal with those situations? And I'm going to give you a couple things. We're going to make this really quick. The first thing is check your motives. If you remember in verse 1 and 2, verse 1 says, Paul, I appeal to you with gentleness and kindness of Christ. That's what Paul really wants to be. He wants to be gentle and kind. He wants to lovingly correct. That's why he wrote these difficult letters. Look, you've got sexual immorality happening in your church. You've got false teachers in your church. Deal with those so that I don't have to come and deal with them. Get those out of the church. They're causing dissension. They're causing harm to the church. We must hit those head on. But he was coming from the motives of gentleness and kindness, not from human motives. Human motives says, look, people are talking bad about me. We need to get them out of here because nobody dares talk bad about me. That's not what Paul said at all. Paul was coming from spiritual motives. He wanted the church to be healthy, and he knew the church couldn't be healthy if, one, there was sin in the church, and two, if there were people causing division and strife within the church. Have you ever been in a church where there's been infighting over maybe something stupid as the color of the carpet or over who got to use what room for whatever ministry or whoever got to use the van or whatever it may be? Those things are sown by the enemy to cause division in the church and it weakens the church and causes the gospel to lose face to all those who are around us. check the motives. We get caught up in our own ministries. We get caught up in our own things. And we want what we want. And we disregard a relationship for God, with God. And we don't do things out of the right motives, out of the kindness and gentleness of Christ. That's what Paul wanted to do. He didn't want to come from human point of view. He didn't want to look at it from a human point of view. Actually, he said the authority that was given to us, if you remember back in verse 8, so the authority that was given to us was to build people up, not to tear them down. And so if he deals with the authority properly and gets the, and people correct their behaviors or gets them out of the church, uh, yeah, I said out of the church. If they don't want to correct their behavior, they need to move on. You can be sinful and be in the church when you come under that authority and realize that you're working on your relationship with God. We're all sinners. We all have things to do, but as long as they respect the authority, they're not sowing dissension. But those that are sowing dissension, they have to be removed. But it doesn't become out of our own pride. It comes out of wanting a healthy church because we're shepherds. We've got to get the wolves out of the church. He's not doing it from a, a human point of view. Second thing is we use spiritual weapons. Spiritual weapons, verses 3 and 5, we are human, but we do not wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God, and we capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. 
That's what they do. It wage war with spiritual weapons. So what does that look like? What does it mean to have spiritual weapons? So I started thinking about that a little bit and I thought, well, you know what? Ephesians, Paul gives us those spiritual weapons in Ephesians chapter six. So flip over there with me. I know we've got a lot of scripture today, but I want you to see how it all fits together. Ephesians chapter six, one of my favorite passages, verses 10 through 18, says a final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you'll be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. One of the devil's biggest strategies to weaken the church by causing division and strife within the church. Yes, the church is for broken people. I'm not talking about somebody that needs God, that isn't living for God, that comes in our church. I'm talking about those from within the church that cause division and strife that have to be dealt with. Now, obviously, if somebody comes in and they're trying to harm people or they're trying to disrupt, we're going to deal with that, even those that don't claim to be Christians. But I'm really talking to the church here. I'm talking to Christians here. If you have a heart that, that sows dissension, man, it needs to be fixed. But here's how he does this. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then, after the battle, you will be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on peace that comes from the good news so that you'll be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet. Take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now, here's the key. Verse 18 puts all of this together. Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. The only way that we can fight against this is to grow in our relationship with God. This has been a theme throughout this whole series, is to grow in our relationship with God. The closer we get to God, the less these things become issues. And when we're closer to God, when we're spending time in prayer, you should pray for all people everywhere, on all occasions, at all times. We need to be a people of prayer. We need to be praying for each other. We need to be praying for our church. We need to be praying for our lost neighbors. We need to be praying for this community. We need to be praying for our community partners. That's our first line of defense. And then the sword is the Word of God. We need to know the Word of God. We need to have the Holy Spirit in us so that our righteousness will shine through, so that our shield, that faith that we have, will be a shield against what the enemy's trying to throw at us. See, people can cause dissension. You might listen to this message and say, that pastor is absolutely nuts, and you may say bad things about me. That's okay. You can. I'm preaching to you the Word of God. It's okay. I've been called a lot of things. My faith in God is my shield. My, the, my, the breastplate of righteousness, you know, the breastplate of armor, it protects all of this. The righteousness, that's not my righteousness. It only comes through Jesus Christ. I've been made righteous through the blood of Jesus. I've been called and then stamped with the Holy Spirit to follow Him, to stand firm. So when I grow my relationship with God, I'm able to deal with these things. And you know what? I'm able to deal with them with boldness and with love. My number one concern is, is somebody so in dissension, I want reconciliation. I want healing. I want them to be a part of the church. I want them to be healed. I want that situation to be taken care of so the church can be strong and grow. But if that person through pride or through anger or bitterness or rage cannot get that under control, then they need to go somewhere else. They need to get right with Jesus. That's the number one concern. That's the goal. So the way we deal with this is using spiritual means through prayer, through the Word of God, through confronting it with a loving kindness of Jesus. Jesus was loving and kind, but He was also firm. Remember when He went and knocked over all the things in the temple because the money changers were abusing their authority? They were charging people ridiculous amounts of money for um, animals for the sacrifice. And they were just robbing people left and right. Jesus came in and cleared out the temple. 
he was righteously mad and just cleared out the temple. Why? Because he wanted God's house to be strong. He wanted people to feel that they could come into God's house and be loved. He had kindness for every sinner. Here's the goal. Listen, here's what Paul wanted to get to. He says, I may seem to be boasting too much in the authority given to us by the Lord, but our authority builds you up. It doesn't tear you down. See, if you submit to the authority of God, not necessarily my authority, I am a representative of Christ. I am your pastor. I have authority over you spiritually, but it's not to tear you down. It's to lift you up. It's to put you in a place where you grow closer to God so all this other stuff doesn't matter. Focus in on Jesus. Get your heart right with Him. If the enemy tries to get you and sow dissension and sow those things into your life, man, pray about it. Don't talk to your neighbor about it. Don't gossip about it. Don't post about it on social media. Pray about it. And then allow the Holy Spirit to deal with it. It's a spiritual issue. It's not a flesh and blood issue. It's a spiritual issue. We battle it in prayer. We battle it in the Word of God. We battle it through the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It's my job as your pastor to pray over you, to love you, to lead you, to give you every opportunity you can to grow and to do ministry. I love each one of you. Jennifer loves each one of you. Do you have bitterness and pride in your heart today? Are you struggling in that relationship? Right now is the time to give it to Jesus. Then I want to challenge you throughout this week. This is a core of our lives. Get in the discipline of spending time in prayer and in the Word of God every day. Put it on your calendar. If you say, well, I've got so much going on. I'm so busy. You know what I had to do? I had to get up earlier. If I need to be somewhere by 7 o'clock in the morning, I need to be up at 5 to get my heart right with God, to get a shower and get out the door. Yeah, I need that extra time. I need an hour set aside to spend time with Him. And if I don't put it in my calendar, it doesn't happen the way it needs to. I want to challenge you today to grow in your relationship with God. Right there where you're at, just spend a little bit of time in prayer. Pastor Jennifer is going to play and just spend some time with him in prayer.
Father, I come before you right now and I pray over everyone that's here. Lord, we rebuke the attacks of the enemy against our church. We ask right now that you wipe out any dissension that may be here. Lord, I'll be honest, we have had a really great time in our church and there hasn't been a lot of that, but I know the enemy wants to creep in and disrupt. And Lord, those at home that are struggling because they haven't been able to get out or or maybe have been just shut in for a long period of time and the enemy is attacking against their mind. I pray right now that you would sure them up through the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that you would go before us today, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, that you would fill us with your power and help us to grow closer to you and closer to each other. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to thank you for worshiping with us today. Have a great week. And remember, you're not going through this alone. We're in this together. See you next time.